As some of you may remember, a few months ago I taught the Gospel of John. Today I'm teaching the first epistle of John. I chose these books because I love the person of John. There's something about his boldness that draws me to him. John wrote a book about Jesus' life and referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. Every opportunity that John had to make reference to himself, he seemed to cherish and celebrate his intimacy with Christ. I think I love John because I'm jealous of him. No man has walked this planet with a closer relationship to the God-man. But that isn't all. I love how he speaks. John was a very outgoing and volatile personality. He was highly emotional and demanding. His writing is very bold, and it's very direct. He is authoritative in his writing. He's committed to absolutes. He's black and white, light and dark. He is an exclusive preacher that we need to hear in this inclusive age. John writes with simple words and writes with clear certainties. Nothing in John's writing is vague or very difficult to understand. And so I want to spend some time tonight talking about him. I think it's helpful to learn about his heart, to learn more about him as we study his epistle. And so let's answer the question of who was John? Like I said, the Apostle John was physically as close to anyone to Jesus Christ in the Gospel accounts. No one has been closer to him. He's one of the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Jesus called him and his brother James the sons of thunder. That title doesn't exactly exude humility, so Jesus had some work to do on his heart. He was bold, he was self-promoting in his ambition. Along with his brother James, he asked his mom to ask Jesus if they could sit on the right and left hands of Jesus in the kingdom. He had a passionate personality. Like I said, he was intolerant and he was very ambitious. When James wanted to bring down fire and burn up the Samaritans, John was right there and agreed with him. Those are the sons of thunder. But something changed in John. He went from the one that argued who was the greatest in Mark 9 to one that church history calls the apostle of love. His theology of love appears throughout his gospel, and so we'll review that quickly. He wrote in his gospel that God is a God of love, that God loved his son, that God loved Christ's disciples, that God loves the world, and God is loved by Christ. He taught us that Christ loved the disciples both as a group and as individuals that Christ expected men to love him, and that Christ taught we should love one another. Love is dripping in the writings of John. But John never slid into some sappiness about love. It was never sappiness and tolerance masquerading as love. And until the end of his life, and he was the last apostle to die, at the end of the first century, he never, never tolerated deception. He never tolerated lies. He was always committed to the truth. He never really tolerated sin of any kind. I think the Lord knew that the most powerful advocate of truth had to also be the most powerful preacher of love. Because otherwise, the truth would come across as harsh. But it came across so sweet and loving. John MacArthur puts it this way. Isn't it interesting that the most clear-cut, black-and-white, authoritative, absolute writer of the New Testament is known in history as the Apostle of Love? Not a love that takes you down the road of tolerance, but a love that takes you down the road of truth. And hold on to this nugget. For telling the truth is the most loving thing that anyone could ever do. John was a lover of the truth more than anything, and he loved the truth and the God of the truth, and the Christ who is truth incarnate so much that he would tell people lovingly absolute truth. Like I said, John lived the longest of all the disciples. He lived until almost the end of fir the first century, probably dying around the year of 98 AD. And so his life overlaps 
many in the generation following the disciples. Let's talk about his authorship of this book. John never identifies himself as the author in any of the epistles. As you read through them, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you don't find his name. So that brings up the question, how do we know he wrote them? I have too many. I have two reasons. There are many more. First, this isn't strange. In his gospel, he doesn't use his name either. He refers to himself by descriptive phrases. I said one earlier that the apostle that Jesus loved. And so when you don't see his name in his epistles, you're not surprised because you don't see his name in his gospel. But more importantly, the strong and consistent universal testimony is the early church. They were people in the early church who knew John, and they knew what John wrote. And they knew John wrote these epistles, and they told their friends and fellow believers that John wrote them. And they passed that down to the next generation, and the next generation, the next generation. And we know today that John wrote 1 John. I want to spend some more time this evening talking about why he wrote this book. I think understanding why he wrote it will give us such a huge insight into what the truths of this book are. So why did he write it? I believe both the gospel and the epistles combat a single heresy that later became known as Gnosticism. It developed over the course of the next century, but the seeds of Gnosticism had begun to affect the church in the time of John's life. And at the end of the first century, see, from 90 to 95 AD or so, John was in charge, in particular, of the churches of Asia Minor, modern Turkey. John was probably an overseer at the church of Ephesus at this time. He had founded it. And out of the church at Ephesus, other churches were established that we know. He didn't found it, Paul did. Out of the church at Ephesus, other churches were established that we know as the seven churches of Asia Minor to whom the letters are written in the first section of Revelation. And I believe this is the audience of this epistle, these churches. So what's going on at this time at these churches? Turn with me to Acts chapter 20 for a moment. Paul is the speaker here, and this is likely around 58 AD. So let's call it 30 to 35 years prior to when John wrote his epistle. Paul has founded the church at Ephesus. He has established the elders there, and now he comes back to meet with them. This is a familiar passage for you guys, I'm sure. They're meeting at a place called Miletus, which is near Ephesus, and Paul is meeting with his own elders that he has established. He's been away, and he's coming back, and he's meeting with the elders at Ephesus. In Acts 20, starting in verse 28, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. He says, Men, become a guard. Go on the defensive. You are shepherds, so protect. And this isn't a warning against a potential attack. This is a New Testament prophecy of an actual event. Keep reading. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He knows they will come. This is truth in Scripture. This is New Testament prophecy. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. And he goes on to, to give them commands on how, what to do because of this. So decades prior to writing this book, that prophecy was given by Paul. And John writes his epistles, I believe, to combat what seems like a fulfillment of this prophecy. False teachers did come in. They came into Ephesus, and they started by attacking their first love. And we find out about that from the book of Revelation. They also were sowing seeds of what later became known as Gnosticism, questioning the fundamentals of the Christian faith, the true relationship between the deity and the humanity of Jesus. And they were questioning who really is a Christian, who is a genuine believer. They wanted some inclusiveness. They wanted to open the door of salvation a little wider to include other people. I think it's also helpful to understand the roots of what this Gnosticism is. Gnosticism was a moving target of beliefs 
that still exist today in some ways. It's difficult to understand what they believed clearly because they kind of held their truth in private. You could only understand their belief if you were taught by an actual Gnostic leader and they kept that kind of private. And so the way that we understand what they believe is by looking at the early church fathers who were preaching against Gnosticism to understand what they were actually combating. That said, let's turn to the left a little bit and look at Acts 8. Church history tells us this is an account of a man that became maybe, most likely, the father of Gnosticism. So turn to chapter 8 with me, and let's start at verse 9. Now there was a man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astounding the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astounded them with his magic arts. And when they believed Philip proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly astounded. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying, hands, laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit had been bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you supposed you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray earnestly to the Lord, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven. For I say that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of unrighteousness. But Simon answered and said, Pray earnestly to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. There are a few things we can observe about Simon from this passage. Simon the magician was a charismatic man. He was able to garner a following and convince those around him that he was a great man. Simon the magician deceived Philip into thinking he believed the gospel, so much so that he baptized him. And then Simon became a follower of Philip, and he was among them watching them. And Peter and John were sent there and had a firsthand experience in this situation. John was there. They saw that God had not, in fact, saved Simon. He did not receive the transformation of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he was so materialistically driven that he wanted to buy the ability to save people. He really had no true understanding of the true gospel. So what did Peter see and say about Simon's heart? That Simon cared more about silver than God. Simon's heart was not right before God. He was holding on to his wickedness, and he was in bondage to it. And verse 24 tells us that he would not even pray. Bitterness had taken him over. The Bible doesn't record what happened next, but Irenaeus, Irenaeus, a Greek bishop from about A.D. 130, writes about him. Simon actually later believed himself to be God. In this account, Simon preached himself as the God who first created. He claimed he descended into human form to bring things to order. Although the account of Simon's religious beliefs includes no reference to Gnostic teaching, Arrhenius concludes that Simon gave the falsely so-called Gnostics its beginnings. If I were John, this circumstance would live with me. It would stick with me. It would influence my shepherding. 
And I believe Simon or his followers had an influence on the audience in 1 John. I believe there's a direct connection in John's mind. Turn with me finally to 1 John. And let's peek at chapter 2 for a second. First John 2, starting in verse 18. Children, it is the last hour, just as you heard that Antichrist. By the way, this is not the Antichrist, but someone that denies Jesus is the Christ. Children, it is the last hour, just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For, they were, for if they were really of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be manifested that they are all not of us. And I'll go ahead and read 4.13 says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. I think he's referencing Simon the Magician in these verses. This is a clear section of the book that I believe John had Simon on his mind when he wrote. But I also think this could have been any number of people who were part of them and went away from them teaching false doctrine, teaching destructive beliefs. And, Paul, and John wanted to write authoritatively against those beliefs. What were those beliefs? In that era, um, there's actually a man named Serinthus who was most likely the leader of the movement in that era. Historians from that era present him as holding these beliefs. And they, if you read these and think about these as you think about what you already know about 1 John, it's going to resonate. He believed that God was not the creator and that Jesus was not God. God was, in fact, distanced from man, so a relationship was unattainable with God in this world. The deity of Jesus and the power of cross, the cross did not exist. The spirit and the flesh were two completely different things, and many would say that one operates apart from the other. So they had a, a category for your spirit being right with God and your flesh being able to do anything that it wants. John held, John thought through, understood these, these beliefs responded to them, and wanted the people in the church at Ephesus in Asia Minor to flee this so badly. And so he wrote this book of 1 John as a direct confrontation of these thinking. At one point, I printed out a copy of this book and started to highlight what all the different Gnostic beliefs were and, and see if I could kind of summarize how he responded to each of them. And the problem I ran into is every single word of this book flies in the face of every single belief of Gnostics. It is a direct, word for, by word, just attack on this Gnostic belief system. Once again, John MacArthur puts it this way. John, living to see the fulfillment of Paul's prophecy in Acts 20, writes the epistles to cry out for the truth of the gospel, the narrowness of the gospel, John is writing to the church at Ephesus first of all, and then in Asia Minor. But of course, the revelation of God was then distributed to the whole church, warning them about the insidious inroads of false doctrine. And he calls for this exclusive kind of perspective, and he does so in terms that are absolutely clear and unambiguous. And that's, that's why I talked so much about this today, is there is such an insidious inroad of false doctrine in the church today. It's everywhere. I, I started to look at, at the broader re world religions, and that's clear that they just don't even look at Christ the way the, the Gospels do. But as you start walking through even denominations of quote-unquote Christianity, you see these truths missing. And, and so it's so important for us tonight and, and just as we live our lives as Christians, to hold tightly to the gospel, to hold tightly to who Jesus is, and to hold tightly to living lives that have been transformed by the gospel. So now we're going to start 1 John halfway into the sermon. 
Um, today we're going to see something from 1 John. We're going to see that a true follower of Jesus knows the truth, and their life is completely transformed by it. Today, I want to encourage you to apply this to your own hearts first, but also use it as a filter for those that are your teachers. Do those you listen to embrace the truth? Are they transformed by it? Do you allow people that are not transformed by the truth of the gospel to speak into your life? Do you allow them to speak into your parenting, into your marriage? That's a dangerous place to be. Trust yourself with people who have been transformed by the gospel. So we're going to look and see that a true follower of Jesus knows the truth, and their life is completely transformed by it. If you're not certain that you are a follower of Jesus, we will review the truth that you must know, and we'll review what your life must look like if you know that truth. And if you are certain that you are a follower of Jesus, Use this lesson as a protection. Don't listen to people that divert from these truths or have not lived a life transformed by them. Remember, holiness is vital. So we're going to split this up. Point one, we're going to survey 1 John and talk about what we need to know. And then we're going to go back and survey it and show what transformation looks like. A true follower of Jesus knows the truth. You're probably still in 1 John. Turn back to the very beginning. If I can get the pages to come apart. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we are writing so that our joy may be made complete. Jesus, God-man, came in physical form. He was visible. He could be touched. The gospel of eternal life is not some mystical truth. John saw Jesus. He was a witness to Jesus. He wrote his account of this gospel, of this in his gospel, and is highlighting it here. In verse 2, Jesus' life was revealed and is a witness so that we can hear about eternal life. Do you remember what John said his purpose of writing his gospel was? It's in John chapter 20, verse 30. He says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also did in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. There are always people who will say faith is something that is entirely divorced from evidence. But that's not in the Bible. Faith is... Biblical faith is believing in something or someone on the basis of evidence and acting on that. In this case, John has provided evidence for the full deity of Jesus so that readers, whether in his age or ours, might believe it and commit their lives to Jesus as their Savior. In John's Gospel, we have an accurate record of things that were said and done in Palestine almost 2,000 years ago by a Jew named Jesus of Nazareth. They are presented to us as evidence for his extraordinary claims. And if one will believe this and approach the record honestly with an open mind, God will use it to bring that person to fullness of faith in the Lord Jesus as God's Son and his Savior. That was his purpose in writing the gospel, and he's very clear about it here in 1 John. Look back at those words that I read in the first few verses what is the result of a proclamation of the reality of Jesus? It's eternal life, it's Christian fellowship, and it's fellowship with the Father and Jesus. John wants the readers to understand that firsthand interaction with Jesus Christ 
will bring a transformation of fellowship. We'll talk further about this when we look at the transformation that comes with understanding the truth. But let's read verse 7. Skip down a few verses on your page. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The next truth is that the blood of Jesus, God's son, and don't lose sight of how important it is that he's referring to Jesus as God's son. In Gnostic beliefs and in beliefs we see all over this planet, he was created as a lesser being. But Jesus came to earth as the son of God, the creator. And that is so important that we, we trust in that and that truth is established. And the blood of Jesus, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. There's an abrupt convergence of the physical and spiritual world here. There is a physical death that must have taken place for sins to be cleansed. Let's move on to two of the greatest verses in all of Scripture. Turn to chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, he says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. John is giving us this book to help us avoid sin. He's very black and white about this. If he left this verse out, the next verse out, we might think that he was presenting a works-based salvation. But that goes away with the sweet words we're about to read. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Ligon Duncan does a great job explaining this verse. He says, in this beautiful verse, John is pointing, out to the person, pointing us to the person and work of Christ as the source of strength and hope and ultimate victory over sin. Indeed, in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter, he specifies three aspects of Christ's person and work. Jesus, our advocate. Jesus is righteous. And Jesus is propitiation. It is vital to understand that the picture is not Jesus pleading with his Father to be loving and merciful to us. Jesus is not trying to get God to love his people, but instead, he is the provision of the loving Father so that he can love his people and show perfect righteousness and justice. But what we want to concentrate on in verse 2 is he is the propitiation for our sins. To propitiate means to satisfy the wrath of God against us, to turn away God's wrath, or to offer a sacrifice that appeases God's just judgment and righteous anger against us and our sin. And note, Jesus is not simply the propitiator, but the propitiation. He is what satisfies the justice of God. The term points to Jesus as a covenantal sacrifice and what his death effectively, not just potentially, but effectively accomplished. John is teaching us this here so that we can understand that Christ's person and work are the ground of our fight against sin, the source from which holiness flows, and the basis on which forgiveness rests. As a result, those who trust in Christ are not frozen or paralyzed in the admission of their sins or hopeless to fight against it. Christians are able to deal realistically and hopefully with sin because of who Jesus is and what he does. Jesus is advocate, righteous, and propitiation. And 1 John 3.16 is such a sweet follow-up to this truth. By this we have known love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Jesus going to the cross is such a significant moment in time. But we must not forget that one of the purposes was to teach. He taught us what true love is. John could have said, by this we have received love, or by this we have seen love. But instead, he said, by this we know it. All of human existence either looked forward or backward to the moment when true love was manifest on the cross. No other example of love teaches us more than Christ's work on the cross. And what was the result of this sacrifice? 
Let's jump ahead to chapter 5. He touches on this topic several times between these two verses, but I think this one is the most succinct, so we're jumping ahead. 1 John 5, starting in verse 11. And the witness is this, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He, does not, who, he who does not have the Son of God does not have that life. And continuing on in verse 20, he says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. A true follower of Jesus knows the truth. And the truth shows itself in three ways. We know that his blood cleanses us of all unrighteousness. We know that Jesus is our advocate. He's righteous and he's our propitiation. And we know that the Father sent Jesus, gave us life through his Son, and that there is one true God that gives eternal life. As Christians, these truths aren't new to us. These truths are central to us. And that leads me to my next point. A true follower of Jesus is completely transformed by the truth. And John highlights this transformation in two ways. He highlights it both in deeds and in relationships. And so let's start by looking at the transformation of deeds. Turn back to John 1. And look at verse 5 and following. And this is the message we heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Notice one of the repeated words in this, sentence, or in this passage. The word say. There are clear contrasting messages here of what we say and what we do. And there are three things he refers to as things that we could say. We could say we have fellowship with God. We could say we have no sin. And we could say we have not sinned. This passage is an opportunity for us to examine our hearts. This is one of the great passages in Scripture to help us understand our assurance of salvation. I can say I have fellowship with God. But what is evidence for me that this statement is true? He tells us, it is false if I walk in darkness. It's true if I walk in the light. In this passage, John is using the metaphor of light and darkness. And I believe in this metaphor, he is referring to acts of good or acts of evil. He says, in God, there are no acts of evil at all. If we say we have fellowship with God, but we walk in acts of evil, we lie and do not know the truth. We can see this clearly by looking at the contrast in the metaphor too. If we say we walk in acts of good, as he himself is good, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. He keeps going from there though. He does not want to be misunderstood. In verse eight, he says, if we say we have no sin, we're lying to ourselves. Walking in the light is not ignorance of our need for a Savior. We have to know that we have sin to understand the truth. And in verse 9, he helps us even further. If we confess, we must confess our sins. And if we confess, then what? He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So is this statement, if you say you have no sin, asking for perfectionist, perfectionism? Of course not. He's asking for quite the opposite. He's asking for a heart of confession of sin. He's looking for a disposition. Think back to Simon the magician. 
What did Peter perceive in his life? He cared more about silver than God. His heart was not right before God. He was holding on to wickedness and bondage to it, and he wouldn't even pray. Bitterness had overtaken him. This is a man walking in darkness, but saying he is without sin. Which leads us to the last thing that we cannot say, and that is that we have not sinned. From this passage, how do you know that God has saved you? You must confess your sins, which means you acknowledge they were there and they will continue to be there. This is not a one and done statement. Confession does not start now and end now. It starts now and continues on until glory. But you must walk in good deeds, not to be saved, but to know that you have been saved. He doesn't say, confess your sin and then walk in the light and he is faithful to cleanse. He says, confess your sins and he is faithful. But if you walk in darkness, you don't know the truth of the gospel. You may be like Simon the magician from Acts 8 and say you're saved, but the fruit of walking in acts of goodness is not there. He reiterates this point in chapter 2. Let's start at verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God has been perfected. By this we know we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. The first part of verse 3 is so important. By this we know that we have come to know him. The act of keeping his commandment does something, but not what many religions would tell you. It does not save you. It tells you that you've come to know Jesus. It communicates something to you about who you already are. Drop down a few verses to verse 9, and he puts more color on what this means. The one who says he is in the light yet hates his brother, is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. A way that we show we are keeping his commandments, a key way that we are walking in the light, is through the love of our brothers. Let's keep going as he expands on the placing of our love. Look at 1 John 2, starting in verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. We must love our brothers. We must not love the world. Once again, not so that God will love us, but to show ourselves and to those around us that the love of the Father is in us. How does this passage describe the love of the world? He gives it three ways. Linsky's commentary described it really well, so I'm just going to cheat and read his commentary. The lust of the flesh is the sinful desire springing from the flesh or depraved nature which seeks sinful gratification. When John adds the lust of the eyes, he includes the lust that reaches out beyond what a person can actually get a hold of in his sinning. The lustful eyes rove afar for sinful pleasure, and then the boastful pride of life. The boastful pride of life does not ask regarding the Father's will, but acts as though it had sovereign direction over its course of life. The translation pride of life conveys a wrong idea. John has in mind a hollow arrogance with, which presumes that it can decide and direct the course of life without God. It will determine what it will do, gain, achieve, and enjoy. Clearly, if you're living a life that is dictated by your terms, the Father is not in you. A true follower of Jesus' life is completely transformed by the truth. Sin will be ever-present, but do you confess it? Do you flee from it? Do you make no provision for it? Do you live your life dictated by God's terms 
Or are you allowing the lust of the flesh and the lust of eyes and the boastful pride of life to rule your heart? That's the difference. That's what he's talking about. And then he goes on also to tell us how our relationships change. All right, we're going back. See, we're circling just like Omri talked about, but we're circling through First John. Um, so verse one, or chapter one, verse seven. I've read this already. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Here, John introduces the concept of fellowship with one another. He's saying if we live out a life that has been transformed by the Spirit, we get two things, and the first is fellowship. Fellowship with one another is on his mind. It's kind of amazing to me that he parallels fellowship with one another in the blood of Christ. That is how important fellowship is in John's mind. So what is fellowship with one another? Scripture uses several images to describe fellowship with other believers. Scripture talks about how you're in the household of God. And this is a household where love and hospitality are the foundation for all interactions. You're in the family of God. This isn't a family that has awkward Thanksgiving conversations only. This is a family that is governed by love, tenderness, compassion, and humility. This verse in 1 John gives us a glimpse at what fellowship looks like. We walk in the light as he is the light. We have fellowship with one another. Jesus Christ, then, is the source and fount of all spiritual communion. Only when rightly related to the Lord do we experience true fellowship with another Christian. Just as light and darkness are incompatible, so a believer can have no real fellowship with an unbeliever. Neither can the Christian be in fellowship with one who walks contrary to the teaching of Christ or a professing brother who is immoral, idolatrous, a drunkard, or a thief. True Christian community and fellowship pours out of lives that are transformed. Let's go ahead and jump to chapter 4. This verse is familiar. It, it still reads with the melody of the song I listened to growing up, and sometimes I have to edit it out of King James. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested to us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. John begins this passionate exhortation to his readers to love one another, a phrase that is repeated three times in verse 7, 11, and 12. Up to this point, love has mostly been seen as a duty for believers, and now it is seen what it, by what it truly is, a driving disposition arriving out of the divine, arising out of the divine nature that, by God's grace, now is within the Christian. We now have in our nature to love one another. John gives us three reasons to love one another. Like I said, in verse 7, 11, and 12. So starting in verse 7, the first reason Christians must love other Christians is that the very nature of God is love. And this demands it. John states this in two forms, saying love comes from God and that God is love. The first of these indicates that God is the source of all love. If this is so, then the one who loves must love with that love which comes from God and therefore must be born of him. If he does not love, he does not know God. And the second form in John's statement is that God is love. This is more profound because love is not merely a gift or attribute of God, but in the deepest sense, it's God's own nature. God is love. James Montgomery Boyce says it this way, John links love to the nature of God in a very subtle way in these verses. 
and this should not be missed. It is seen in the fact that each of these statements regarding love and our need to love is linked to one of the persons of the Trinity, so that the entire Trinity is involved. In verses 7 and 8, the reference is to God the Father. It is that we have it is this that we have just been considering. And then in verses 9 through 11, the rest reference is primarily to God the Son. God loved us so much that he died for us, and therefore we should love one another. And then finally, in verse 12, in the phrase, God lives in us. The reference is to God the Holy Spirit. And again, the conclusion is the same. Love one another. In other words, God the Father is love, God the Son is love, God the Spirit is love. Therefore, if we know the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we will love. It's difficult to see how the matter could be more simple than this and more pressing upon the conscience of the Christian. And then John connects God's love to our obedience. Look at chapter 5, starting in verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. What a sweet conclusion to this truth about love of others. To love God, and by extension described in chapter 4, others, we must keep his commandments. And this isn't a burden. Let me read a few of the commands from Scripture that highlight our love for each other. This is pulled from the one another list. Care for one another. Bear one another's burdens. Be kind. Comfort one another. Pray for one another. Build each other up. Admonish each other. Speak truth to each other. Encourage. Be hospitable. Give preference. Regard one another as more important than yourself. Confess your sins to each other. Be devoted. Accept, don't envy, don't lie. Live in peace and fellowship with one another. These are not a burden. These are sweet love for each other. And these are the commandments we must keep. The so what from the book of 1 John is interesting because he gives it to us clearly in three different ways. John wants you to have joy. John wants you to live a life of holiness. And he wants you to hope in eternal life. He wants you to have assurance of salvation. Look at 1 John 1, 4. And these things we are writing so that our joy may be made complete. He had a bigger purpose than saying, I want to give you the truth. He says, I'm writing these things so that your joy may be made complete. That's the real goal. It's not just the truth. It's the joy that truth produces. He learned that from Christ himself. If you look at John 5, or 15, 11, in the upper room at the Last Supper, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. He's quoting Christ. The Lord had taught John that truth is, the purpose, is, is for the purpose of producing joy, lasting, full, complete joy. The straightforward, unambiguous, exclusive, black and white, dogmatic, authoritative, absolute, certain truth that Jesus taught was to bring you joy. And so John approached his ministry the same way, and we should take joy in this. The next reason that John says he's writing this book is in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. That's strikingly unambiguous and clear. So the third one. 513, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He wants you to have joy and holiness, and he really, really wants you to have assurance. He wants you to hope in eternal life. I want to add one more reason. Look at the last verse of this book, 521. He closes with an amazing short verse. He doesn't end with a benediction. He doesn't even say goodbye. He almost leaves them with a cliffhanger. He says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Idols are anything that is put in your life to receive worship. He ends this book 
about how great Jesus is and how our life is transformed by him by saying, don't let idols creep in. Idols creep in. They creep into me. Thinking through your week this week, where have you let worship replace God? Or where have you let something else be what you worship other than God? Maybe it was at your job. Maybe it was in your home. Maybe it was with your kids. Maybe you just wanted quiet from your kids. Maybe you had an accomplishment at work go unnoticed and it burned your heart. You were worshiping that. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Why do you think John ended this book with that statement? I believe it's because John knew that without truly embracing the truths of this book, we would become idol factories. We can so easily have a wrong or insufficient view of God and his saving work at the cross. But if we take the time to remember that our lives are full of sin and are therefore way short of God's standards, and God and his perfect plan went to the cross to suffer and die in the place of judgment and punishment for us, how can we do anything but worship? How can we worship idols when we remember that he asks us to put our faith and trust in the death of him on the cross? John 5.21 warns the believer to guard yourself from idols. And the way he asks us to do that is to know the truth of the gospel and to apply that truth to your life with holy living and changed relationships. Let's pray. Lord God, this is such a sweet, precious book. Lord, thank you for preserving this book so that we could sit here in Tempe in 2024 and read about who you are. Lord, there is such an amazing truth of just, just your love for us, Lord. I don't know how to comprehend it. I sit there in awe of it. Lord, and I want it to change me. I want to grow in my love for others. I want to grow in my love for every single person in this room, in this church, Lord, help me to see who you are and what your love is. Help us all to see it so much more clearly every single day so that out of that understanding of your love, we can love. In your name, amen.